Good afternoon. My name is Alex Falinski, and uh, the title of my talk is Looking Beyond the Human Ropeworms, or the Latin name for that is Homo funis vermis. Holy shit, he just broke taxonomy. Hello everyone, this is Carolus Linnaeus, and he's very upset right now, even though he's been dead for over 200 years. Carl von Linné, better known under the Latinized version of his name, Carolus Linnaeus, is considered to be the father of modern taxonomy. He was the first to consistently and systematically categorize a wealth of botanical species in his book Species Plantarum in 1753. He did this according to the binomial system. This eventually led to the universal adoption of this system among biologists. Linnaeus grouped species together based on similarities under this system. Even though he lived a hundred years before Darwin and his theory of evolution, he managed to reasonably approximate evolutionarily meaningful groups. Once the groupings became linked to evolutionary groups, and especially when genetic data became available, some species have had to be moved between or within groups, but the overall pattern was fairly accurate. The power of the binomial system lies in the fact that it keeps names simple and unique at the same time. A binomial name consists of two parts. The first is the evolutionary group that the species belongs to, the genus, and the second designates the species within that group. See, for example, in this evolutionary tree that shows the relationships between these five animals. The coyote and the wolf are in the same genus, so both their names start with canis. Canis latrans is the coyote, and Canis lupus is the wolf. In the same way, Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalensis, and Homo sapiens are all in the same genus group. I think you might start to see the problem here. Names in the binomial system have significance, and you can't just make them up as you go along. By calling his worm Homo funis vermis, he has grouped it into the genus Homo, more closely related to humans than a chimpanzee. In other places, he did not include the homo part, but even then, that will make its genus the Latin word for rope, which doesn't exist, and its species the Latin word for worm. In reality, he hasn't really used the proper naming system at all. All he has really done is literally translate the words human rope worm into Latin, and pretend as if that gives it some kind of legitimacy. Oh shit. That was only about the first 12 seconds of his talk. All right, moving on. I also decided to put uh, some videos that are related to this on the YouTube channel that is listed over here as long as every slide that is shown here. The reason I put this picture, uh, that's, what, that's the way I looked like in 2009, and hopefully you can try to make a connection uh, with this. So I want to start to say that I don't really know anything. And this is a, a quote from Socrates. I also want to state that when people don't understand things, they tend to look at the mystical ways, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Wait, what? When people don't understand things, they tend to look at the mystical ways, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Dude, if you keep saying things like that every minute or so, I'm never going to get through this video. When people don't understand things, they tend to look at the mystical ways, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Really? Did he not get the memo that every time humanity has done that so far, the answer turned out to be wrong? What the hell is lightning? Must be Thor! This is pretty much an argument from ignorance. I don't know, therefore it's mystical. That basically means, I don't know, therefore I know. Because it's mystical. Yeah. That just doesn't work. Next, he's just going over the list of the things he'll be talking about, so I'll just skip over that. And on to the next part. So I want to warn you, though, that whenever you hear something, it is advisable to go back to the original source and check, because this is exactly what happens, right? Everything you're going to hear today, you probably already heard, but don't remember, and maybe you even know it better than I do. So please check check the original source. And that's where the preconceived knowledge comes from, and we are never doubting that. There are certain dogmas that are built into different aspects of science that at certain points could be challenged. But because we inherit this knowledge, we never, we never go back to the original experiment or the original data to see if that is really the case. 
Okay, going back to the original source is great advice, but I don't know what you're talking about in regards to dogma. I don't know what kind of school you went to, but for me at least, in high school a lot of old experiments were repeated because it's a great way to learn the basics. And then in university I took a class that was completely dedicated to repeating classical experiments of a higher level. And even if they weren't repeated, there is no way we would be able to solidly build up the way we do if our foundation is wrong. Eventually, inconsistencies would start to appear and the foundation would come crumbling down. We call that a paradigm shift. An example of that was when we moved from a geocentric to a heliocentric model of the solar system with the sun at the center. The existing model with the earth at the center was still useful, and it was the best explanation available to the people of the time, even though some inconsistencies existed. The model of geocentrism could explain the world around us to a certain extent and was useful for star navigation at sea. As new information was gathered, more and more inconsistencies were found. A critical point is reached and a paradigm shift occurs to a hypothesis that better explains the facts. In this case, heliocentrism. That's how progress is made. A more recent example is a shift from classic Newtonian physics to Einstein's theory of relativity. Newtonian physics has been useful since its inception, and in fact still is useful on a normal day-to-day -day scale. It just doesn't explain certain phenomena that the theory of relativity does explain. When a paradigm shift happens, some of our most basic foundational assumptions are overthrown. Yes, this has happened a few times in the history of science. It's a process that gets us closer and closer to an accurate model of the world around us. So with that warning, I'll tell you a little bit who I am. I'm an engineer, and I'm a scientist, and I'm a professor of mechanical engineering, although here, for the, for, for the purpose of this talk, I'm not showing my affiliation with the University of South Florida. I'm doing this because Dr. Klinghardt invited me to give this talk. Uh, please do not look at my credentials, because I'm just a voice. Imagine that you hear some guy talking to you on the airplane, and you don't know who I am, because that's really the what it is. It's just the information. Treat it for what it is. So, and, and your credentials, because you are attending a medical conference, is way better than mine. So why you should even listen to what I'm going to say. You can be sure that I will treat your nonsense for what it is, and based on the information I have so far, I have no idea why anyone would invite you to speak at a medical conference. But at least an audience of doctors will be much more likely to see right through you, so thank goodness for that. Uh, well, I am the warm, the, the rope warm pendulum leader. I'm going to explain what that means. Also, for my job, I tell people what, they, how this material world, world works. You know, my specialty is in material science and engineering, so I teach and I tell students what things are, starting from the atomic structure and moving on. So, that's my job. I tell other people what they're supposed to see in this dual mirror of the material world. But more importantly, what's specific for this conference, I did this. And I have personal experience. And you can see the picture before and the after. And I can do it if you're interested. Duh. As a scientist, you should know this. Anecdotes are useless and in no way comparable to actual data. I already went over this in a previous video. There is a reason why modern medicine uses double-blind controlled studies. Without those kinds of safeguards, bias creeps in. The differences between anecdotes and research are enormous. Double-blind controlled trials can tell us exactly how many people took part in the study, how many of them saw improvement with the treatment, how many of them thought they saw an improvement even though they received a placebo rather than any real treatment what side effects the treatment might have, and how many patients drop out of the study for reasons such as severe side effects or difficulty maintaining the treatment. Anecdotes tell us that some people thought they saw an improvement out of an unknown amount of people who tried the treatment, and just as dead men tell no tales, people who tried the treatment and saw no results are not going to make the effort to contact you. That makes testimonials automatically biased. Without controls, there is no information on whether the treatment is the cause of any actual improvement, or if it could just be a coincidence. 
and there is no way to connect side effects to the treatment or to find out how common they are. So basically, no, I'm not interested. Skipping over how sick he apparently was because it's irrelevant and it's really getting long-winded. If you must know, here's the list. My favorite one is etc. Uh, it happened to me, I'm going to tell you what happened to me, but after the fifth day of uh, water-only fast, uh, this came out of me. And my wife is an MD, she's an uh, MD and a PhD, specialized in endocrinology. And her mother is, my mother-in-law, they were both visiting, and I showed them that. Um, and they said, this is not, this is not a parasite, this doesn't look like an asteroid form, this is, this is the lining of your intestine. Okay. And, and uh, I was puzzled by this, so what I did is I went to many different forums, uh, Russian forums primarily, and I posted the picture and I said, what is that? Uh, I'm going to talk about this, all right? And this brings me to the major reason why I decided to look at this talk for my video. Booba Marcus. My intention was to partially use this video as a way to address this comment. Who are you, Genetic Julia? At least Gubarev and Valinsky have the guts to reveal their identity. You seem to be an amateur biology student who tries to get fame feeding off of other people's work. Julia is not a paid troll, but she feels the need to stick her finger into every hole. Before you say anything, chlorine dioxide or any other oxidative therapy, try it yourself when you will <laughs> when you will see the ropeworm sticking from your ass, maybe you will use the book knowledge learned in school to actually study the ropeworms. Good luck to you, Julia. Thank you for spending your time to actually make this video. I would have said that he's right, and I'm just a biology student. I'm not a doctor, and I don't pretend to be one. But arguments and the science that backs them up stand on their own merit, regardless of the person who made them. That's pretty much what I would have said. But, because I was going to use this comment for my video, I actually went to take a look at their profile. This is Dr. Velinsky himself. That made this comment just that much more ironic. His previous Funus Vermis channel has been deleted. It kind of looks like he's trying to be anonymous while accusing me of being anonymous. Dr. Velinsky, I just can't figure you out. Are you really this naive? Do you really believe all these claims you make? You have a legitimate PhD, and as far as I can tell, you do at least some legitimate research when it comes to your own discipline. You have published proper peer-reviewed articles, and some of them have even been cited quite often. In those cases, I am very sure you don't use the same methods that you are proposing in this talk. You act like you are so humble because you don't have any of that darn knowledge that medical doctors have gained from years of education to clog your mind. And of course, that allows you to look at things from a fresh perspective without the bias of, well, actually having a clue what the fuck you're talking about. There's a reason your articles on ropeworms can't pass peer review. Now place yourself in the shoes of another scientist for a moment here. Imagine, say, a medical scientist coming into your discipline and butchering the scientific process to introduce crazy nonsense into mechanical engineering. You know what mechanical engineering really needs? More appeals to mysticism. How does that sound? If that sounds ludicrous to you, I have made my point. If it doesn't, Nobody can help you, and you have no place in a scientific discipline. I may not be a doctor, but your wife is. Your mother-in-law is. They told you it was gut lining the first time you showed your worm to them. Sneering at my background or anonymity seems slightly disingenuous when you prefer Russian forums over the opinions of two doctors you personally know. This video is for you. So thank you for your comment, and I hope you appreciate the time I spent making this video as well. I have to end it here, for the sake of time. I did still want to take a look at the latest DNA results he mentioned in the intro, and would have added that if only I could have found it anywhere in the talk. That's a real shame. This talk? Maybe I'll go into the rest, but really, it only gets crazier from here. I talked about this space of variations. Have you seen the movie The Aliens? You, did you like it? You know what? This is one of the plausible explanations in the infinite number of possibilities for the rope worms.